It is Friday the 13th. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. It's just it's not just Friday the 13th, it's August 13th, which is the day that we had been reliably assured would mark the reinstatement of Donald Trump as President of the United States. Remember when Mike Lindell, uh, my pillow guy, was confidently assuring people that his symposium would come up with evidence that was so compelling that the Supreme Court would rule 9-0 to reinstate Donald Trump as president. And apparently Donald Trump was telling people that maybe, hey, you know, you know, keep keep your August open because stuff might be happening. Uh, I regret to tell you that the reinstatement day has been postponed, although our good friend and colleague Tim Miller is out with his new Not My Party. If you haven't seen it, you really do need to see it. But he talks about this alternative universe out there of people who might have actually thought that today was going to be kind of a big day. Let's play a little bit of audio. But rather than deal with these real world problems, about a third of the country is stuck on an imaginary Earth 2, where infectious disease doctors and climate scientists are part of a mysterious cabal, and Donald Trump remains the president. And in that world, it is wild. In the bizarro world. <sighs> we disagree with you. One of the most influential Earth 2 figures is the Pillow Man, a former meth addict and current <laughs> bed cushion magnate who promises that Trump will be reinstated as president on Friday the 13th. Friday the Day. Pillow Man told Trump's former chief strategist, Sloppy Steve Bannon, that he's plotting with the son of Brazilian strongman Jair Bolsonaro to return Trump to power. This mm. madness is on one of the top five most listened to news podcasts in America. Watch. It's a matter of fact. Trump won, and Trump won in a landslide. Donald Trump won 80 million to 68 million. According to Mike Lindell, uh, restore President Trump for his rightful place. And the pillow plot seems vaguely plausible when compared to this end times bad shittery from a conservative pastor. I know for a fact that he has already been inaugurated and is president. And <laughs> Yes, so back uh, on Earth up, One. on. <laughs> I love Tim. You're laughing at your own stuff. That's what I, I tickle <laughs> myself, Charlie. I tickle myself sometimes. Uh, seriously, people need to, uh, to 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 go to our web page or to Snapchat and, and watch these. The this 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 I think is actually one of your most entertaining, <laughs> Tim. Um, uh, the pretty, I have to shout out Drew on this one. Who really? I had the, the Earth One Two One Two concept I had, but he really he really took it to the next level <laughs> this week. You know, I mean, so the the I also like the fact that this is for Snapchat, right? And and you yeah. bleep out the bat shittery, whereas we are the Bulwark podcast, and we we don't bleep out anything. Isn't that wonderful? Just, and is they're they're really tough on us. Uh, you know, we can't have cigarettes in there. There are a number of rules. So Snapchat is, uh, to their credit, are, are trying to be the anti. You know. YouTube and Facebook, where all of this, you know, misinformation gets put up there and, all, you know, all, all this, you know, scam scammery. And so they have they have some tough sensors over there, but not here at the Bulwark podcast. No, but you should definitely check this out. And by the way, I, sh I should mention this, that you were on uh, the podcast, this podcast a yep. week ago today, and that was not just the most downloaded podcast in the history of the Bulwark podcast, but it was the most downloaded podcast by a huge margin. So we're all looking at each other going, is this just the magic of Tim Miller or what? Was it just, I, I mean, think it was I, that the I, headline I, of the article was chode. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I think people, were, I think people see the word chode and they're like, I'd like to learn a little more. The, this was the, the, the chuckling chodes of disinformation. Um, yes. So, the, this crazy continues, and I don't want to. There's a lot of other things we need to talk about, but as, as you point out, you know, it, as as bizarre as all of this is, it, it's having implications. I mean, we, we heard this week that we saw that story of the number of election officials around the country that are actually concerned for their safety um, may quit because there are so many crazies out there making threats. We know what's going on down in. Arizona with the you know cyber ninjas continuing all of that. Um, we have one state after another changing its election laws based on I don't know taking my pillow guy seriously and and you had a great story th this week about this Republican election official from Colorado this rural Colorado county she's a Republican she's a Trumpist she's a you know stop the steal folks and it turns out that she was messing around. Tell me a little bit about this because this is in the news today. This Colorado Republican Trumpy official is now facing a criminal investigation yeah. because she had what leaked the 
the uh, the, the, the passwords uh, to some right wing site to say, see, we can show you how it's hacked, which is brilliant, right? Yeah, I mean, it is it is about the stupidest criminal activity you could possibly imagine, Charlie. And you know, kind of I laid it all out um, in, in an article, I, I guess, on Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, I was tipped off by my friend, the Colorado sports guy, Jeff Morton, who is who has some pals in Mesa County, uh, Colorado, which is on the west. It's on the border of Utah. Uh, it's Grand Junction. It's it's uh, you know sort of the a mid small to mid sized town um, uh, on on the Utah Colorado border in Lauren Boebert's district, of course, and and he's like, this story seems really weird, and and so I started calling around my old pals in Colorado, and I called some folks at the Secretary of State's office, and I, I was like, what is happening with this? And, and they got on the phone with me, and when they started laying it out, I just I was in our the bulwark Slack texting, you know, messaging everybody. I was like, we have to get this up immediately. <laughs> like this is the stupidest criminal activity I've ever heard. Essentially, the short of it is they want this woman, Tina Peters, who's MAGA and had made news in January by attacking Republican senators publicly by, you know, who, who, who did not vote to overturn the election, saying she knows as a county clerk. You know who, like your guest earlier this week, who was great, Stephen Stephen Risher. Is that how you say his yeah. name? Yeah, Stephen Richer. Richer. Yeah, she, yeah. she has that job, but for a smaller county, uh, and saying, "I know that the machines are vulnerable. You know, you guys are wrong. You need to overturn the election." She sent these crazy tweets, and then had to delete her Twitter account. And so then six months later, uh, something weird happens on 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 Code Monkey Z, who is who is a. Uh, the guy who we assume is QAnon, actually, this guy named Ron <laughs> Watkins, uh, on his Telegram feed, uh, he posts a video with with some very some pr- private the passwords and the login information to voting machines, and and he and he says that this is big bombshell that proves that the voting machines are vulnerable, and 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 you know you can see the private data, and the Colorado Secretary of State this gets flagged for them, and they're looking at it, and they're like, well. That's the that's this crazy woman in Mesa County's machine. Like we obviously we know we have the master password uh, to to all of these to all, to the voting machines, so we know who it was. This woman leaked the password to her own voting machines to the QAnon people as part of an effort to prove that the voting machines were vulnerable. But then she gets caught red-handed, and so now um, uh, she's obviously facing criminal charges. She was at the Crazy Pillow Man's conference this week at the symposium. Oh, of, of course she was. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But I mean, this is this is like, you know, uh, if, if anything, not, not only is it a massive cell phone because, you know, now she's facing criminal charges, but it also just proves like, you know, breaking into to voting machines is, is a lot harder than it seems because she tried to break into her own voting machines and it didn't exactly take, you know, MacGyver to figure out who the uh, who the culprit was here. I mean, the Colorado Secretary of State knocked this out in about two seconds. Um, and they also were able to not only figure out, you know, what county it was, but when it happened. Because, you know, there are only certain times a year where they go into the passwords and 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 you know review it for everyone so um so you know she was caught very easily very red-handed just like Matt, mike lindell has been exposed as a phony very easily um and so you know but, but unfortunately as i as i said in that clip like people are buying this shit i mean i'm, well, I'm so grateful we real had genius, thousand, yeah listeners to this last week but steve bannon's number three no, uh, yeah. See, th- that is that is the problem. There are tens of millions of people. And look, I I'm old enough, as you know, uh, to remember when Wisconsin was less crazy than some other states. But here in Wisconsin, we have the uh, not crazy Republican Speaker of the Assembly who is trying to go through the motions of investigating the election. And so he's hired a former Supreme Court justice. His name is Michael Gableman uh, to do this review. Michael Gableman, somebody that's actually showed up at some of the Stop the Steal rallies and all of that stuff. Uh, I don't know what the hell's happened to him. But anyway, so he's on the taxpayer dime here in Wisconsin. And guess what? He was also up at the Crazy Fest, Mike Mendel, uh, Mike Lindell, my pillow guy, Crazy Fest. So, uh, great return on investment for uh, those of us who pay taxes here in Wisconsin. These people are out there. Um, yeah, it is that. That is the problem. Is there's an audience, and even though Mike Lindell melts down and goes, "Okay, okay, it wasn't China. Okay, I don't actually have anything," it's not going to change the momentum of people who who believe this. Okay, so. Uh, we have an update from the leopards eating people's faces party. 
Okay. Who did this? The people know this. It's from the this okay, this meme. Sure, I voted for the leopards eating people's faces party, but I never knew that they would eat my uh-huh. face. This would be the Dan Crenshaw chapter of all of this. Dan Crenshaw, who is every once in a while tries to pose as a serious person, but is you know pretty full uh, MAGA. He actually gets heckled by uh, some of these MAGA folks at a recent event because he refused to say the election was stolen. So uh, this is this is kind of one of those moments where he does the right thing, but the karma is strong with this. Don't kid yourself into believing that's why we lost. It's not. It's not. You're wrong. I'll tell you, I'll tell you openly. You're wrong. You, and I'm not wrong. Yes, you are. Five, five I have states. plenty of proof. I have proof in Arizona, I, Pennsylvania, and Georgia. You, you did the Maricopa. Yeah, How did that and, turn out? and guess what? It's going to turn out, and it's going to flip. Okay, we're you gonna watch. Gonna, we're going to. You're going to see it first. Won't. It won't. And, and you've got to flip all five states to make. You it know work. how they're stealing the elections? All right, I'm not going to argue this. I'm not going to argue this. This is something. Look, I'll, I'll say it openly. This is something you got to accept. Is there are a lot of voters? He is yeah, right. Probably that is. is. I don't think Trump won. No, absolutely not. You'll see. Absolutely not. Five different states, yes. hundreds of thousands of votes. Yes. Kidding yourself. Next question. You'll say. You'll say. Next question. <laughs> yeah. I I had been feeding this alligator and he was really cute and small in the bathtub and I have no idea how he got to be this big and is out roaming the streets eating people and he's coming after me. Congressman Crenshaw said, I don't know. So Yeah, and Dan Crenshaw, by the way, people, you know, like to forget this and memory hold this. And uh, but you know, he signed the insane Ken Paxton lawsuit that I was, was that was mm-hmm. not about Texas, that was about that was about taking away the Ken Paxton lawsuit and, and it was not, you know, when Dan explains it now, he likes to he likes to do that. Oh, we were just asking questions and we just yeah. wanted the Supreme Court to review whether or not this was legal. The Ken Paxton lawsuit called on the Supreme Court to take away the legal votes of people who voted based on what the, they understood the rules to be in Pennsylvania and give their vote to the Pennsylvania state legislature. That is what the um, uh, that is what the lawsuit was. That is what D- Dan Crenshaw signed on to. Now he tries to pretend like that lawsuit was just you know about what about you know the the subtleties of the rules regarding coronavirus and the elections and. All this nonsense. It's not what it was. And and so, uh, you know, I mean, he's never apologized for that. He's never said that was a big miss on my behalf. And, and, you know, now he wants to be praised by the, it is, I guess, to his credit, I'm happy that he's saying the truth. and, And I think that he's misjudging, you know, where the momentum is in the party. Like he wants to be praised by the you know, quote unquote, quasi nor the National Review crowd or, or, you know, the the daytime Fox crowd instead of the evening Fox crowd about his courage on this front. And 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 so, you know, I, I mean, I think that uh, obviously the crocodile analogy is apt, but um, but th- this was. This was an extremely obvious result, and and Dan Crenshaw went into it full full bore. So it's hard to hard to feel bad for him getting shouted. Yeah, down. no, I'm I actually uh, in my newsletter today I posted it's kind of a flashback from a piece I wrote in February about uh, Crenshaw Reloaded. This was when he was posing for holy pictures for about five minutes, um, remembering that uh, back in November. As you know, Trump was gearing up to overturn the election. Crenshaw had a video where he sneered about the what he called the this direct quote sanctimonious pearl clutching that our democracy is under threat. That is absurd. And then, as you pointed out, he did sign on to that completely bogus lawsuit. But now, now, now he's shocked to find out that there are people out there who really do believe the election's going to be flipped, that five states are going to overturn their results. <laughs> These people are out there. Okay, you want to talk about uh, and are, by, the vaccines? By the way, just really quick, yeah. if you look at that crowd, I think this is important because sometimes, yeah. you know, I, I think that in our little coastal, my coastal elite bubble, obviously you're in the heartland, mm-hmm. uh, you know, people think that, you know, this is American. like the Alabama crazies and, you know, uh, you know, this is this is people co- not college educated. This to me looked like a fundry. I don't know exactly what the event was, but it was suits and ties, you know, at this event. Like Dan Crenshaw was not out with the rubes, right? Like this. Ha- and I think this is a key thing is I've, I've been sort of writing about this and interviewing some of my friends in the party, um, uh, uh, former friends. <laughs> um, uh, you know, they say that like. You know, their doctors will are say these things to the Chamber of Commerce heads, right? This has infected much beyond, 
you know, just the most insane part of the base that you might think it would be um, in, in your mind's eye. And I think that's a, just a, an important un- to understand just how how big the how big and fattened the crocodile has gotten. You know, I, 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 I think that this goes back to like 2015, 16, 17, when uh, Jonah Goldberg came up with the expression that, that watching Republicans go Trumpy was like watching Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I, yeah. I've, stole, I've stolen that over and over again. But it feels like that on a weekly basis as you go, OK, you used to be a normal, rational human being. And now you're saying stuff like this. It, it is like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. So maybe we need to redefine the word rube. Maybe the rube, the rube, of it, the you know the the intellectual rubes, and then the, okay. So speaking of, and I know, just don't say that you shouldn't insult them. We should show them more respect. Um, I, I should have talked about this yesterday when I talked to Amanda Carpenter, because this this went absolutely viral. What happened after this uh, Tennessee school board meeting, uh, where the school board voted to put in a mask mandate, and you had healthcare professionals who testified in good faith, explaining how the mass worked, why it would be a good idea to protect the children and the, and the staff by, by wearing the mask. And, and most people probably know this story now. As these doctors and nurses are going, trying to leave, going home, this mob of, quote unquote, of parents, which is also kind of blows your mind, starts screaming at them and threatening them uh, let's just play a little bit of audio. I mean, imagine being one of the doctors or the nurses and you're in your car in the parking lot and you've just basically testified, not basically, you've testified um, based on your medical expertise why masks prevent the, you know, the, the, the spread of this pandemic. This is what happened. We, we know who we you know are. Who you are. We, know we know who you are. You can leave freely, but we will find you, and we know who you are. You will never be allowed in public again. You will never be allowed. You never let us be allowed in public again. I know who you are. Yeah. 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 Shit. Can you imagine that? I mean, even Biden was President Biden was asked about this yesterday, and it's one of those moments like. Have we just all collectively lost our minds? I mean, this this is I, I described it last night on television. This is the know nothing revolution. I mean, it is a revolution of people who are clinging to their ignorance and and who resent people who will not ratify their ignorance to the point that they threaten them. We know who you are. We know where you live. Damn. Yeah, I think my old friend Clay Travis was at. I don't. Know if, I don't know if it was at that meeting or one one of the other ones. But he, I was watching a video he put of himself riling up the crowd. Um, you know, to with the pitchforks to over overthrow the school boards. Look, I mean, obviously people get sensitive with their kids. You know, and 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 I understand that. Like emotions run high with your kids, and and it's been a tough year. And you know, everybody was kind of figuring that we come to the fall and things would be quasi back to normal. And, and then that's that it's not and that's taken away from them. So so I, I can understand why some people's emotions w- would run high around this debate. But it just shows that as a culture right now, like we are incapable of of negotiating these culture war fights um, that, you know, in Washington, but even in our communities. Right. I mean, I just like there are reasonable concerns about what some of the school boards have done with remote learning and with, and with teaching. There are reasonable concerns with how some of the more conservative school boards and, and, and governors are like banning, you know, mask and, and, and distancing rules from some of these states. Right. I, and like there's no clear answer. And this is all changing in real time. Right. Like what seemed very obvious in July and what might have been merited this kind of uh, reaction if, if if a school board was going to you know have a overly you know draconian covid rules like like d- doesn't make sense anymore right like that that reaction doesn't make sense anymore because of the changing well, that, nature that reaction, of the virus that, and what we're that, learning that, that, yeah tim that reaction never made any sense well oh I mean, I, right, yeah, no, yeah, no, threatening okay. people but i just i just mean no. just just a normal parent being upset that that the schools are going to do you know put in certain mask rules um you know maybe back in june when it seemed like the the virus you know the the vaccine a vaccine rate was going up and the virus was going away like it has in some of the other countries I, like like being upset would have made sense like yeah. being upset doesn't make sense now right because well, I, because now the schools need to ne- navigate this changing environment and, and and but but now we have these insane people who are who are out there uh uh just just completely stirring the pot and preventing there from being any sort of rational discussion well, I, I'm, about a, this. I'm actually upset about this issue as well and some people are confused about my position i i really don't like masks 
I don't want to wear masks. I, I really resent having to wear a mask because of the failure of people to get the vaccination. If we were serious about the vaccination, if the unvaccinated um, you, you know, did the right thing, then we would not be having this discussion. We would not be having this argument. So, right. uh, you know, it's and I, I'm glad, by the way, to see that now the, the big teachers unions have finally realized that they look like, you know, that they have been not helpful by not being in favor of the vaccine mandates. But I can, what I find extraordinary is this aggressiveness, um, yeah. the aggressiveness of uh, the continuing aggressiveness of people like Greg Abbott, Christy Noem, Ron DeSantis, who, who I mean, DeSantis, in, in his defense, and this is going to be a very short defense here, um, <laughs> you know, has, has taken the vaccine and said people should get vaccinated. But then the entire rest of his governorship is making it impossible for private companies um, to do this. Uh, up until like about five minutes ago, he was threatening school districts that we were going to withhold the pay of the superintendents if you made the local decision, remember when conservatives believe in local control, uh, to have masks. Now he's backing off saying, well, okay, I guess I apparently can't do this. But talk to me a little bit about Ron DeSantis and why Ron DeSantis is not adjusting his message or his approach even while the hospitals are filling up and he has to beg for ventilators. Yeah, I'm going to give also just a very brief Ron DeSantis defense first. And and that is, you know, the the left wing media reaction to him last year was a little bit overboard right. versus where where huge what gift his, to him. Yeah. Yeah. It was a huge gift to him. And, and it was it was a mistake um, by the left, politically speaking. Uh, and it just didn't m- meet the facts. Right. Like Don, J- Ron DeSantis was like the median Republican governor last year. It was he had he made some really bad calls. Um, he made some some decent calls, like some of the school's actions in Florida turned out to be better than than what some, some things happened in blue states. Like he didn't make the nursing home call that that Andrew Cuomo did. That was a nightmare. Right. So so he was a median bad. Uh, he wasn't he wasn't the top of the list. But but at turning him into like the floor into the worst place in the country just didn't meet the facts. Right. Right. That was last year. This is now. Right now we, we know how to mitigate the virus. And that is with the that is with the vaccine. Like net, the vaccine is the path out of this out, out of this madness. And and here we are after having. Uh, not a cure, but like an, uh, a, a very strong deterrent for, from, from the worst outcomes of this virus and the vaccine. And, and here's Ron DeSantis standing in the way of, of tools to incentivize it. Like what you would expect right now a governor to be doing is that their number one, two, and three priority would be what can I do to get more shots into arms? You know, whether, remember, it was the door-to-door thing that was right. proposed by the Biden administration. Uh, 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 you know, De- DeSantis and other Republicans demonized that. Whether that was the lotteries that's happening in certain states, DeSantis refused to do that. Whether that's private sector incentives, um, DeSantis is suing and failing, losing, but suing private companies for, for that want to have the freedom to to ensure that their customers are safe and protected, which is which is totally uh, reasonable and obviously within the law, which is why it got thrown out of court with such alacrity, right? And so, and yet, because of what happened last year, and because of the fact that Ron DeSantis is the great the great white hope of the you know of the anti anti Trump crowd, uh, you he is you're not allowed to broach any criticism of him now without an, a massive pushback from from the right. And there was this leak today. I don't know if you've seen it. It just came out this morning, Charlie, of Fox of Martha McCallum, who's a daytime Fox host, emailing the DeSantis office. Um, this was, I guess, foyed by, um, by a news outlet, you know, saying that, that she wants to start highlighting the future stars of the party. Martha's ready to move forward and she wants to make, you know, she wants to highlight Ron and do more with the De- Governor DeSantis because she sees him as the future. And that is a microcosm of what you see on the right. So just like there might have been overkill last year, right now I, it, it, there is extreme under... Um, uh, uh, scrutiny from anybody that's even one inch to the right of us because they all see Ron DeSantis as their hope of getting out from under Trump. They're sick of having to defend Trump. They don't want to have to defend him anymore. I'm, uh, you know, I'm talking about the anti-anti crowd. Obviously, there's a MAGA right. crowd that loves Trump. They're sick of having to defend him. They see DeSantis as their way out, and so they can't broach any criticism. But here he is. There, it's like 100-plus people are dying per day in his state, and, and he's you know having press conferences ranting about the border. 
you know, he's suing the cruise companies. Um, he's he's trying to punish school local school boards and dock their pay. Another thing they tried to do that was illegal that is illegal. Yeah. Remember all the fake uh, upset on the anti anti crowd about the norms and of Biden trying to to right. do something he knew is illegal. DeSantis is doing things he knows is illegal. To own the libs, the cruise ships, and the docking school board pay. So, you know, and, and you don't see anything out of him that's like, oh, here's here's how we can start to get more shots in arms because we've we've plateaued in our state. It's 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 just it's horrific and we know how to are the way out of it. He refuses to do it because he wants to, you know, er, keep earning Martha McSally's pray or excuse me, Martha mm-hmm. McCallum's praise as someone who who pokes his finger in the eye of the left. Well, and also as part of this culture, you never apologize. You never admit right. you were wrong. You, 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 it's all about fighting. So it's the, it, it makes it very hard for him to pivot. And in some ways, he's trapped by all that. So I actually looked up what you were just describing. This story um, from, uh, was it the Tampa Bay News uh, paper that discovered this? That yeah, probably St. Pete, Tampa Bay. E- e- emails between Fox News and Ron DeSantis totaling, <laughs> this is the part that got me, totaling 1,250 pages <laughs> Over four months, lay bare how Ron DeSantis has wielded the country's largest conservative megaphone and show a striking effort by the network, Fox News, to inflate the Republicans' profile. On one level, this is completely not surprising to us, right? I mean, but this is how it all works. It's just, right. to, you know, see it laid out. So one producer told DeSantis that he could, that he could pick the topic if he came on. <laughs> oh, really? Another told DeSantis' team that it was the goal of Fox News host Martha McCallum to spotlight the stars of the GOP, and of course, and as you mentioned this, and um, in January, Maria Bartiromo used a graph from DeSantis during his interview, and it goes on. So, How yeah, is this what different surprise. than the Chris Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo thing that every, all the right-wing media watchdogs were so upset about, by the way? Seems pretty similar to me. So where do you come down on the Chris Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo thing? It was I, bullshit. I, 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 what, what's bullshit? Yeah, I think it's, all, what they were I think doing. it's cringy. Yeah, yeah, no, I meant what they were doing was bullshit. The criticism is a bullshit. Like the fact that the during the height of the pandemic, when New York was having one of the worst responses in the country, Chris Cuomo and his brother were, were having a buddy buddy hour. It was horrible. It was obvious. It was cr- cringy and terrible. It's just my point is that. That's not except for the fact that they're brothers. Uh, his the, his treatment of his brother is not any different than what these emails show. Fox's treatment is of DeSantis. I, we all know this. This is obvious. It's dog bites man. But but it's important to not let there be this imbalance because it's like oh because we know Fox is a hack shop. They don't get criticized for this, and because CNN, you know, is purportedly not hacky, um, they do get criticized for the Chris Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo thing. I mean, it's the same. Yeah. Both, both is to, well, both are terrible. Well, okay, but the, you know, CNN actually does hold. This is the problem of when when you have one entity that has no norms or or shame whatsoever. Does that mean that you can't hold other entities that actually claim to have a certain level of integrity to right. higher standards? You follow me? I mean, on all this, I mean, CNN basically says we are not fox we are not hacky we are not you know complete shills and yet they did that cuomo thing which is like damn you know i mean yes it's deeply unfair that chris cuomo you know that some people think chris cuomo should lose his job whereas hannity is obviously solid but that's what happens if you actually have real standards it's a little bit like you know should you should andrew cuomo have to go for being all gropey when republicans did nothing about donald trump and the answer is yes you know it's it's sometimes very annoying and inconvenient to actually have standards but if you actually have standards you need to hold your own team to all of that so yes there's something right. grossly unfair about Andrew Cuomo being held responsible when Donald Trump is, but he still needs to be held accountable. So, you know. yeah, you're absolutely right. One more yeah. thing on this Fox thing and on the circling the wagons around DeSantis, uh, you know, because I, I was over on the third network, MSNBC, uh, uh, making basically the point I just made about how DeSantis is putting owning the libs ahead of public health on on some of these calls. And I was listening to your I hadn't listened to it yet um, when when this had happened. But um, I, I was listening to your podcast with Tom Nichols from last week mm-hmm. and how there was this emerging trend on the right of attacking everybody that they don't like as a childless cat lady. Oh and yeah, I hadn't Oof. seen that yet. I hadn't seen that, and 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 um and it had, and I and I just had this light bulb go off because that is what happened to me. So I get off MSNBC, yep. Yep. and like I I get swarmed by all these like 
random right wing chodes uh, who are who are calling me who are saying like who cares what Tim Miller thinks about Ron DeSantis school's decision he's a childless cat lady in, in California and it's and I like I was deluged with t- tweets about people calling me a childless cat lady so I guess this is the new cuckold it is not true I don't I don't I don't I do have a child and don't like cats so that was a kind of a big fault in their in their criticism of me I guess they assumed I didn't have a child because gay but um right uh, yeah this is very, I, I also very don't subtle. care for cats yeah very really, really subtle stuff but but it, it's interesting that this is like the new Thing. Um, uh, the new attack line, right? Like the, the new way to to other, you know, uh, anybody that doesn't hold your that doesn't defend Ron DeSantis obviously must not be a good family person from Jacksonville. They must they must be, you know, a childless person that's obsessed with their nine cats. Well, th- this is I'm, I'm not going to defend cat people, so I'm, I'm kind of okay. with them on the, on, the, on the cat thing. But but um, it is interesting. I was listening to an, an interview that I think J.D. Vance had with uh, Tucker Carlson, and he's really pushing this line. that This is not just a casual throwaway, you know, that that it's there's something wrong with the power elite being, you know, childless. And, and he mentions he goes, you know, AOC and Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg. Uh, two women of color and a gay guy, um, you know, are, 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 are childless. And it really is, this is going to be a theme. You're going to be hearing it more and more, and it will resonate with part of the base. But, and I was listening to, you know, some of the analysis and I thought some of it missed the point because as, as you have mentioned, I mean, there's some codes in there. This is a way of going after gay people, number one. It's also a way of of playing the abortion issue, you know, that, of course, liberals hate children. They want to kill them. They don't have them, which, of course, is ridiculous. But it also raises the question, Okay, so it's all about being parents. But what and and also this I know this sounds naive now. What policies are they advocating that actually help parents? I mean, are they in favor of the child credit or parental leave policies nope. or nope. What, what, what what exactly besides basically saying you know that you know that that uh that, that gay people and kamala harris and other people like that kamala harris has stepchildren like, by the way i mean I, that i think that they i mean they call her mamala um doug's kid yeah. so you know that's just 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 a quick fact check on that one but i, uh, I just think it's you know, no they don't there just, no there, there is no i mean it, 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 vance uh, you know, at least attempts to put a policy sheen right. around a his populism bit. away in a way that other that a lot of these other folks don't. And Holly, Vance and Holly, honestly, are the two. And mm-hmm. and Holly did, I think, support a different. I've, you can never support anything that evil Joe Biden does. So he did not support the child tax credit that actually went into place and, and is helping people right now. But you know, he had an alternate plan. But like besides that, uh, I mean, all you know, honestly, the answer is, sh- is shutting down the border. Because they care so much about children, obviously that the that the children leave in Guatemala and Honduras, but that those those kids don't count. Actually, we can't yeah. do anything to help those kids. It's white kids that we're talking about that we need to be concerned. So, about. so in, in 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 fairness, you are right that there was some support for some of the child credit, just nothing that would actually ever happen. Right. So it, it's sort of like the anti corporate Republican Party that will rail against corporations, but will never, under any circumstances in our lifetime, vote to raise a you know a nickel of corporate taxes or the Josh Hawleys who, you know, are pro-family, but will never actually get around to voting for a piece of legislation that might actually make it easier to raise a child. I mean, that's that's kind of the, it's all it's all the, the performative uh, populism out there. Because you could certainly make the case that some of the things, and I'm not endorsing all of the human infrastructure plan. No, by the way, neither, okay, me neither, take, by the way. That is the cringiest I, I know, no, phrase. No, no, but, but, but okay, well, then can I come back to that in a second? Um, <laughs> because, because I really wanted to ask you about that. But you could certainly argue that the, most of the, many of those policies are very pro-child, pro-family, pro-natalist. You know, increasing mm-hmm. the uh, incentives. Okay, so you're you're the message guy, right? FDR, the New Deal, Lyndon Johnson, the Great Society, Joe Biden human infrastructure they can't even what? they can't even come up with a fucking name for it i mean the, what? human really, infrastructure which is like some sort of saturday night live oxymoron type thing you know it's really bad charlie there's some good stuff in there there's some bad stuff i, I you know hopefully because the because of the reconciliation uh, r- rules most of it has to be paid for i've got my friend 
and and bulwark super fan brad who emails me always about how how we never mention the dead anymore and we're turning into just as bad as the other guys and i i do worry about some of the spending and and uh, i i do think that some of that at least has to be paid for i don't mind if the if the corporate tax whatever you know offsets some of this um and but uh but the, as a branding exercise I mean, it's a nightmare, and I keep begging. I keep just hoping that I get asked about it on MSNBC because I need to do a a rant about it to you know shit, rattle the cage of the people watching because I, I they've somehow convinced themselves that this is that this is great that this is great like human infrastructure that makes a lot of sense. It's it's like what the hell are you talking about? It doesn't make it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't describe anything. It doesn't get anybody excited who's not already a you know resistant super fan. Um, and, and I, they need tangible, the child tax credit was good because it's a tangible thing. Here's what we're, if you have children, we're, we're giving you this assistance. It is something you see it in your, in your bank account. You know, you know that this is, um, uh, uh, you know, something that's, that's improving your life at a time that, that you're, you know, dealing with some, um, you know, struggles because of the virus. Uh, I, you know, some of the particulars of it, I didn't love, but like that is, the, that is good, right? Like the, these broad, you know, grab bag every every priority of every interest group thing with a with a phrase like human infrastructure on top of it. That that is a recipe for stimulus part. Remember the stimulus in twenty ten? Yeah, that, that didn't, yeah, yeah. It, yeah there, were, like, there was some good stuff in there. There was some bad stuff in there. It was a political nightmare because nobody felt like it helped them actually, and 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 it was easy to demonize um, by the right. And and I'm worried that the second part, the first infrastructure is fine. I'm worried that the second, the reconciliation thing, is going to have the same same problem. So Tim, would you do me a favor? Yeah. When, when you do this rant on MSNBC, would you just uh, send, you know drop me a note or something something on Slack? Because I want to ask you, what was your best memory of your brief period of strange new respect? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hey. Um, speaking of which, um, I, I want to talk about what what happened to Hot Joe Summer. Um, uh. My newsletter today. My newsletter today headline is Biden agonistes the crisis of his presidency, and I want to get your take right after this. Hey, Charlie Sykes here. Uh, Just a quick reminder, if you sign up for Bulwark Plus, you will have access to our morning newsletters to JVL's Triad, uh, as well as our whole suite of podcasts. This one will remain free, but if you want to listen to the secret podcast or uh, participate in our live streams uh, or others like the Next Level podcast, uh, please consider joining Bulwark Plus. All right, we are back with uh, my colleague and good friend Tim Miller. Uh, we all thought this was going to be hot Joe summer. Um, he's he's having a tough week. I mean, let's let's just be honest about this. This was supposed to be the big infrastructure week, which it was. Seems like a million years ago now. But you have this absolute disaster in Afghanistan going on. You have a real do have a crisis on the border. People are worried about inflation. So I want to get your take. This th- these images and stories out of Afghanistan are absolutely horrific. Biden says he's not having any second thoughts. They're comforting themselves with polls showing the public doesn't care. But this is not a good look, Tim. We rebranded it Hot Joe July. Uh, okay. I don't know if you, you missed the memo on that. I, I, I missed memo, that. I sent a memo around. Um, okay, okay. Um, Hot Joe <laughs> July. And it was nice. It was a great July. I got a vacation yeah. in. Um, I, I boy, enjoyed July. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Afghanistan. Uh, look, I mean, uh, this is a, um, you know, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm of two minds to this, right? Because I, I think this is an excellent sign of po- of left wing populism gro- gone awry, right? I mean, th- there was not a a massive, uh, uh, you know, among the foreign policy elite set, you know, there was not a sense that, that like a total date certain pullout was the right thing to do here, right? Like there was there was a sense that you know I think what Bill what you put in the newsletter what Bill tweeted yesterday that that you you could keep a low force number here and maintain some stability and that seems to be the consent bipartisan consensus among the foreign policy elite set, but there was a populist groundswell for getting out of there. The, and and for good reason. I I understand why people wanted to get out of there. We've been there for for longer than the lives. There are people who voted in the last election who who weren't born when we went into Afghanistan. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, there was not popular will. You do need popular will in a country to have, you know, to be putting lives of, of people's lives at risk. So I understand why there was populist upset at that, but that you can now see the limits of, of that. Uh, the problem is that the foreign policy elites have been wrong, <laughs> like basically so every much. Yeah, for yeah. like a quarter century about everything. Right. And so it's like, where's the trust? You know, I mean, I mean, this uh, to, to the Trump administration, for example, um, you know, uh, uh, why for my, my strange doing respect it's gonna be totally gone after this after this sentence charlie but um <laughs> but you know they remember they moved the the embassy right the foreign policy there was always this concern among the center left foreign policy elites if we move the embassy in israel that there's gonna destabilize da, da, nothing happens right and so you know I, there, there's this boy that cries wolf element that the foreign policy elites have been wrong on both sides you know obviously just the Bush administration's foreign policy in both Iraq and Afghanistan was an utter nightmare and, and was one of the worst decisions of, of the last quarter century. And then the Obama administration's decisions in Syria were an utter nightmare. Right. And, 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 you know, and so now and now you get into to to Biden and it's like, well, let's just do what the people want. Um, and, and, and that turns into an utter nightmare. So it's just been like disaster after disaster after disaster among everybody on every side of, of all of these issues. And, and so I, I have some sympathy with for why they did it but boy it, I, it's, I just, it's just been a it's just uh, there's just it, no way to spin it other than right. a, just a total disaster I, I I also have mixed feelings about this because I don't want to have a forever war. I don't want to have more Americans uh, dying in a, in a war that has no end game to it. But but I think Bill made a really good point in the tweet you mentioned, you know, that we could have kept 3,500 troops in Afghanistan and kept a decent status quo. Instead, they chose this really rapid, um, uncontrolled with, withdrawal. And what you're seeing is humanitarian catastrophe and... I think the political, uh, you know, fallout is is not going to be good. And of course, now we have to send three thousand troops back in to get the remaining Americans out. I mean, it is for those of us old enough. It is Joe Biden's Saigon moment where you're going to see people scrambling onto helicopters from the embassy. I mean, the fact that we have to send troops back in to save American lives is like. Oof. And I want to read you something else that 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 I, you know, let's be honest. We have to. Be really be honest about this. And Alex Burns from the New York Times tweeted out a quote. It's not his quote. It's from, uh, I think, uh, the Financial Times. Uh, if Donald Trump was presiding over this debacle in Afghanistan, the foreign policy establishment would be screaming bloody murder. They would be condemning the irresponsibility and the immorality. But since it's Joe Biden in the White House, there's largely just kind of an embarrassed silence from that foreign policy establishment. And I got to say, you know, that's true, isn't it? It is true. It is true. And and here's the other thing is that like there, there, there were, I, I think, some real – Valid criticisms, particularly from the anti-war left, about um, you know who is doing the service in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, you know during the Bush, uh, especially the end of the Bush administration and after the surge, and 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 the weight of this was being carried by largely working class people. I think it drove a lot of the populist pushback um, on in in both parties, um, and 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 it was it was not. It was not fair. What well, the the situation that we were putting our troops in? That wasn't the case. Now, right? Like, like, like you know, we have active duty, you know, listeners and readers um, who who are serving over there, and and there, I think that there really is a remaining military corps that wanted to see the mission through, right? And and, and I think that there was a military, an establishment, a foreign policy establishment that wanted to see the the mission through, and, and I think that obviously, if this had happened under Donald Trump. Uh, you know, they would have been, you know, had their hair on fire about this. And so, you know, I, I just I, you have you, you do not do Joe Biden any service by never criticizing anything that he does. Right. I, I think that there's this mindset that's like, well, the the Trumpies are so scary that, that we can't bridge any any, you know, internal debate or criticism. And, and like that, that is a path to to really terrible governance. And and that's a path, by the way, to giving the, the right back control because bad, bad governance and stupid decisions, you know, lead to 
you know, uh, uh, popular pushback. Is that going to happen in this case in particular? I, I don't know. I, 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 I do think I maybe know. the population is so detached from Afghanistan at this point, and it's such a small part of the country that was doing all of the service, and thank you for your service, but it's such a small part of the country that's carrying the burden that, that maybe there really isn't any popular pushback to this, and it's just a human rights nightmare, which is bad enough. Uh, but but as a, the principle of the matter, there will be other things like this that, you know, if, if you if you just, you know, respond to what, you know, interest groups in your party want without any, um, you know, without having to, to de- you know, be, while being shielded from any criticism or pushback, you know, that's going to lead to bad results in other areas, too. Right. And I, I agree. I don't know what the what the poll results are going to be, but so, sometimes you know, the morality and the wisdom of the decision yes. shouldn't be simply based on the polls. So, the, you know, you know, you know, this is bad for Biden because even the bulwark is savage in his critique. I mean, even the bulwark. <laughs> so I just want to read this because this is kind of devastating. The Joe Biden who promised to put human rights at the center of his foreign policy is the same Joe Biden now stubbornly paving the way for the world's cruelest human rights abusers to reestablish their regime in Afghanistan. Biden had promised us that he would restore the soul of America, but words are cheap. As the remaining troops have left Afghanistan, Afghan provinces have been falling to the Taliban like dominoes. Men of the Afghan military are reportedly being executed. Women and young girls are being forced into marriage and sex slavery. And the same Biden administration that prides itself on its concern for social justice, racial justice, gender justice, and LGBT pride is going to stand by and watch girls' schools shut down, ethnic cleansing against the Shiites, and homosexuals stoned to death yeah i yeah and, so. and it's true in other places by the way it's been it's, the unfortunate thing is my biggest this is my biggest criticism of biden but I, I don't know maybe my biggest personal disappointment of biden is i do think in other areas also the human rights foreign policy has taken kind of a backseat to domestic concerns and 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 you haven't seen him you know sort of push back and reorder some of some of trump's um, you know, sort of uh, human rights atrocities and his and the Trumpian foreign policy of budding up with the Saudis and all these other all these other assholes throughout the world. And I would have liked to have seen a little bit stronger rebuffing of that and, and pivot from Biden. And you know, they've they've not they've not prioritized that. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, I think Shay's article is 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 you can't you can't argue with it, right? You, yes, you yes, just can't it, argue. It this is what's happening now. Now here's here's the here is what I, I guess you could say is that. Um, you know, I was I was reading because I knew we'd be talking about this. Um, you know, a bunch of like I tweeted out yesterday. I was like, well, somebody, will people send me why this has gone so badly from an Afghanistan yeah. perspective? And, and and I think that there is a compelling case made by by folks who've served over there that you know the Taliban have uh, you know to use the old phrase the hearts and minds on their side and and like and like the Taliban the people who are fighting with the Taliban are fighting for. God and their passions and, and the people who are fighting for the Afghanistan government are fighting for money. Right. And, 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 and that's an imbalance that was always going to, to benefit, you know, the Taliban side. Of I this. think that's true. Um, and so, uh, you know, and so then that leads you to the question of, well, like how long could we have, you know, how long are we supposed to prop this, these folks up with money? Maybe forever, like maybe forever is the answer to that. And like forever, non quite, not quite war is the solution. Um, but, um, you know, uh, the you, you have to actually come to terms with that, with that reality. That doesn't take away the the atro- atrocities of human rights for people that, that that don't want the Taliban and for the women that that don't want that in particular and who are going to suffer sexual assault and death, stoning. But um, but but you know, there that is that is I think the reality on the ground. At least again, I'm not an expert. I've never been to Afghanistan. No, I based, think that's based true. on the reading of the folks that 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 have. Okay, well, one last thing in the, in the time that we have left um, yep. that, that I found very interesting yesterday, and I was, we're sort of doubling back now to the coronavirus and, and the vaccine issue. Yeah. Uh, the the U.S. Supreme Court, actually, Justice Amy Coney Barrett denied an emergency injunction um, from some uh, Indiana University students uh, challenging the school's vaccine mandate. Uh, she uh, could have referred the matter to the full court. She acted alone. She slam dunked the request and... MAGA world lost its freaking mind. And here's another reminder that that the tr- that Trump world fundamentally misunderstood what it meant to be a conservative justice. They thought a conservative justice would give them everything they wanted, would side with them in their tribal obsessions. And so 
when Amy Coney Barrett, you know, essentially says, hey, um, I actually am pro-life on this particular issue. <laughs> and the university is completely within its legal rights to require vaccinations because schools have been doing this forever. The reaction is fantastically interesting. Amy Coney Barrett is a coward and traitor. You know, your good friend, Emerald Robinson. I'm joking, <laughs> by the way. You know, so she'll refer to her as Amy Comey Barrett. You know, here's somebody else. Nice. Trump was wrong on Amy Coney Barrett. His advisors are the problem. He needs to boot almost everyone surrounding him to the curb and do it now. Steve Dace, who is one of these people who's speaking of invasion. Oh, I of the go body way back snatchers. with old Steve I do, Dace. I do too. He's completely lost his mind. Um, Amy Coney Barrett had a chance to stop the unjust persecution of a Christian. Well, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this, this is again a reminder of the one area that I think has been a bright spot has been. The fact that the conservative judiciary has not lived down to Trump's own expectations, that, that, that being conservative on the law meant something completely different than what MAGA world thought it meant. Yeah. And, and I think that is in line with also, you know, what we've seen from some of the governors who are, who people are, who the MAGA world is upset with, right? Um, you know, your, your DeWines in Ohio and justices and, and, and Hogan's, right? Like it's the same thing as the courts. Like these are folks who are living in reality and trying to, A, as far as the courts are concerned, follow the constitution and B, as far as these, you know, more center right, if you will, governors uh, in trying to, you know, come up with a more technocratic solution to what is happening here um, during this pandemic. And, and, you know, that is not feeding the id of MAGA in the way that, that they want it to. And and that is why this is, you know, Ron DeSantis' big moment. I, I just think that if you look at what, what Indiana is doing, what the cruise lines were doing is obviously correct. And, you know, I, I get this pushback on Twitter. It's like, well, what do you what do you expect? What do you want Abbott and DeSantis to do? I, I want them to do everything in their power to try to encourage vaccinations. Because right now, you know, there's a poll that came out yesterday, Biden voters are vaccinated 89% yes, three no, eight, uh, you know, unsure. Like tr uh, Trump was, I think, 54, 32, whatever, 14, mm -hmm. whatever's left unsure, right? Okay, so, so the Trump, it's the Trump base. And then there's another base of people that are just disaffected, that are just not inside our political culture wars, that are just not getting good information. I, you know, I uh, last week's Snapchat show, uh, last week's Not My Party was about was getting vaxxed and targeting younger younger yeah. folks. I got a really nice note from somebody who was like, I've been getting bad information. I didn't know what to think about, about left and right. I watched what you, what you saw. I'm going to get vaccinated. That's amazing, right? And, and, and so, you know, there are ways to get to some of these disaffected folks via the, the school mandates, the, the cruise line mandates, um, uh, the door to door. And, and, and the MAGA governors are, are standing in the way of every one of those because they want Emerald Robinson and Steve Dace to rub their belly. Right. And, and, and so good on Amy Coney Barrett and good on and Mike DeWine, et cetera, for not doing that. But, but this isn't going to be resolved until we find creative ways to reach, to reach those folks. No, and, and it's this is an important point because if, in fact, the anti-anti-Trump folks were serious about advancing Republic, a Republican agenda that was not Trumpian, why would Mike DeWine not be their heartthrob? Why would we not be talking about the governor of Utah? Why would we not be talking yeah. about Spencer's governor of justice? I mean, these guys, um, in, in, in many ways, the and Amanda Carpenter made this point yesterday, uh, DeSantis is in some ways an outlier, but He's the one they've decided is the superstar, the rock star, not all of the other Republicans around the country who are doing the right thing, which is very revealing, don't you think? <laughs> Extremely. <laughs> Tim Miller, thank you so much for joining me again on our weekend podcast. Always appreciate it. You've had a busy week. You were uh, flying back and forth between the coasts. Uh, so I hope you get a chance to put your feet up over the weekend. I'll do that. Everybody have a good weekend. Thanks, Charlie. And spend some time with your child and I your non-cat. Non <laughs> I will. And thank no you all cat. for <laughs> thank you for listening to the Bold Work Podcast this weekend. We will be back on Monday, and we will do this all over again. <laughs> <laughs>